Okay, so um, today we will start re renormalization group equations, which are um, differential equations that govern how um, Green's functions or S matrix elements or some coupling constants evolve as you um, as you change the renormalization parameter mu. Okay, so that's uh, what falls under this heading and I'm going to first start by talking about the simplest thing which is the coupling constant. We can we'll do it in some detail and let's see what we learn from there. Okay, so let me remind you what we have done so far. So we have seen that the bare Lagrangian density is written in terms of two parameters lambda and m. Okay, these are bare parameters. But if you write the renormalized Lagrangian density then instead of two you have three lambda r, m r and mu where mu is the uh, renormalization scale and you remember that we introduced this because the coupling constant became dimensionful in um, d dimensions where d is 4 minus 2 epsilon. So let me also remind you that we are using 4 minus 2 epsilon. Okay and um, good. Now if you calculate any physical quantities in principle, you can keep epsilon fixed so that nothing is divergent. Okay, so you can think of a theory being uh, studied in d dimensions. And then lambda and m are finite. Okay, they are singular only in the epsilon going to zero limit, but to make our arguments, it's better to think in terms of epsilon finite, uh, non zero. So these are constants. So any observable that you calculate using this original Lagrangian in terms of lambda and m will not depend on mu, right? Because it depends only on lambda and m. But if you calculate the same objects using these three observables, uh, these sorry, these three para, uh, these three variables, lambda r, m r, sorry, using these three, then it looks like you have an additional parameter. Okay, so instead of 2, you have 3. And as I said last time, this allows you to change the value of mu, okay, because mu is not fixed by any physical uh, scale in the theory. Okay, even when you are scattering particles, and let's say you have certain incoming momenta and certain outgoing momenta, there is no relation of mu to any of those moments. Okay, this is completely arbitrary. Okay. This has no, no physical relevance, no physical meaning. Okay, so let me write that down. Mu has no physical meaning. So the way you work is you fix some value of mu, choose some value of lambda r and m r, and that will fix the values of lambda and m. Okay, and that defines your theory. So all physical observables are then defined once you have made a choice of mu, m, r and lambda r okay? because that fixes m and lambda for you. For example, the physical masses or, or the probabilities of certain scatterings or any scatterings. Okay? And as we are, uh, uh, this was last time that I can choose to change the value of mu without al altering the, the theory provided I also change lambda r and m r such that it compensates the changes in mu. Okay, so we said that lambda r should be written as a function of mu, m r should be written as a function of mu. Okay, such that we keep these parameters fixed. Okay. So this fixes the theory. 
so lambda the bear the bear parameter here is a function of lambda r of mu m r of mu and mu okay it could depend explicitly on mu and also implicitly through the coupling constant and the renormalized mass okay and similarly the bear parameter m would depend on the renormalized coupling constant renormalized mass parameter and mu okay the dependence will be typically both explicit and implicit through these variables okay so now let's look at um, the coupling constant first and see what this requirement implies for the coupling constant meaning how lambda r changes when you change mu okay that's the question we want to ask so how should lambda r and mr change with mu we want to know this uh, how exactly that behavior is okay so what is lambda lambda the bear parameter is z lambda that's the wave function sorry that's the uh, renormalization constant that we had introduced and then to make lambda r to be dimensionless we had absorbed the dimension of lambda here okay so we had introduced a parameter mu and raised to the 2, two epsilon now i should be writing it more explicitly so i will write all the arguments of z lambda so z of lambda will be in general a function of lambda r which in turn is a function of mu should be a will be a function of mr which again is a function of mu okay the renormalization scale mu can also appear explicitly and of course you will have epsilon also appearing in the argument okay that is how um we wrote down lambda r mu all i have done is just made all the arguments of z of lambda explicit okay so what i have done is i have written all the quantities that can in principle appear okay without leaving out anything unless i have a argument why certain parameter will not appear i should write all the things okay i know when i renormalized i have to uh, uh subtract infinities poles will be there so there is epsilon dependence of course when you calculate feynman diagrams they will depend on lambda r and mr okay and you have already seen log mu appearing explicitly so there is an explicit mu dependence as well so i have listed down everything okay both the implicit dependence on mu and explicit dependence on mu okay good but uh, see left hand side doesn't know about mu right hand side does so if i change mu lambda should not change but right hand side even though individual pieces z lambda mu to the 2 epsilon and lambda r individually they will change but they all should change together in a manner that the dependence completely gets cancelled because the left hand side is independent okay and that is all i am going to utilize now okay uh, no great wisdom just this much so um because lambda is a um, bare object and independent of mu this is this recording must be so d lambda over d mu should be zero okay that's the simple statement that lambda does not depend on mu at all now this is zero i can multiply mu here you cannot stop me from doing that so i'll just multiply that the statement is still true okay and it's customary to introduce mu here uh, as this factor um now what it means for the individual factors okay so i'll just take the derivative 
on the right hand side of this equation. So zero is mu d lambda over d mu, that's the expression. So I'm just differentiating that. Maybe I'll write it here again. So okay, fine. So the first factor is z, you remember that. So mu dz lambda over d mu. And the other factors were mu to the q epsilon and lambda r. Let me write it here. Lambda is z lambda mu to the q epsilon and lambda r. I am differentiating this. Then the second term is when I differentiate this mu to the 2 epsilon, it gives me a 2 epsilon times mu to the 2 epsilon minus 1. But then I have a mu multiplying here. So that makes it again mu to the 2 epsilon. So I get. Okay, and finally I differentiate lambda r. Okay, so I get z of lambda mu to the 2 epsilon and mu d lambda r over d mu. That's what I get. Okay, now let's divide by z lambda mu to the 2 epsilon. If I do so, then I get squeeze a factor of lambda r so this mu to the 2 epsilon goes away from each of the terms. Okay. Here in this one, I will get, so I'm writing this lambda r first, lambda r, then z of lambda will come in the denominator, 1 of 1 over z lambda, mu dz lambda over d mu. Okay. Plus 2 epsilon. I have divided by z lambda, so this goes away, mu to the 2 epsilon goes away, and I am left with lambda r. And in this term again, z lambda goes away, mu to the 2 epsilon goes away, and you are left with mu d lambda r over d mu is equal to 0. And it is d lambda r over d mu that is what you want to calculate. Okay, you want to know how lambda r changes as you change mu. So that thing is here, which you are searching for. So let's define this as um, beta tilde. It's called beta function. Define beta function, which is beta tilde is equal to mu d lambda r over d mu. Okay, so from the definition itself, it's clear because lambda r is a finite object, it's a finite number as epsilon goes to zero and mu is any way a parameter. This beta tilde is a, uh, is a finite object. Okay, beta tilde is finite okay. because lambda r is finite. We are not expecting the derivative to blow up, so this group is finite. So, substituting this in this equation, I will get so this is beta tilde. So, beta tilde, I take these two terms on the other side, it's other side, it's minus 2 epsilon lambda r minus lambda r. Um, 1 over z lambda mu dz lambda over d mu. Now, beta tilde or the beta function is finite in epsilon going to 0 limit. This object is finite in the epsilon going to 0 limit. Epsilon goes to 0, so that goes to 0. Lambda r is anyway finite. 
and that implies that 1 over z lambda times mu dz lambda over d mu this factor is also finite okay so since beta tilde is finite 1 over z lambda mu dz lambda over d mu is also finite Okay. Now uh, I will uh, look at um, the, 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 let, let's suppose that we are doing the calculation in the MS or MS bar scheme. And you remember the advantage of using MS or MS bar scheme is that um, Z lambda and ZM, okay, where ZM is the renormalization constant for the mass parameter they do not depend on the scale mu okay and this is an all order statement and that in, uh, further implies that uh, z lambda and zm they do not depend on mr also so let me say, say this so i'll be using now ms or ms bar scheme okay i will call them together as ms scheme minimal subtraction because the difference between ms and ms bar is purely a constant okay it does not involve any mu the difference is just log mu minus uh, sorry log of 4 pi minus all gamma okay. you, you you have seen this log of 4 pi minus all gamma okay. so in ms you subtract only the poles and in ms bar you subtract together with the pole these factor uh, sorry these two terms which always accompany the poles okay that's a statement at one loop, but a similar statement is true at higher loops also. Okay, so I have already told you that Z lambda, Z m do not depend on mu. Okay, explicitly. And because Z is one plus order lambda term, okay, and one is dimensionless, and because mu does not appear, you cannot construct any dimensionless ratios, meaning you, because you do not have mu, there is no way you can construct such an object, okay, which is dimensionless. So there is no way MR can appear, because one plus, if you were to construct some function which has MR, it will be dimension free. Okay. The only way it could have been dimensionless is if you had mu also available to you, then you could have divided mu over mr, mu uh, by mr, and that ratio will be dimensionless. Okay. But that is not there, so it also does not depend on mu. And for this reason, these are these schemes are called mass independent renormalization schemes because there is no mass scale appearing in in these schemes. So uh, this is why MS schemes scheme is called mass independent renormalization scheme. Okay, so now let me tell you how Z lambda would look like and Zm would look like if you were to calculate to um, higher orders in perturbation theory. So the general form of Z lambda would be this. And you have already seen um, at one loop what it looks like. Okay. So it starts with one, okay, because you do not require renormalization if uh, if you are at the free level. Okay, free level doesn't require any renormalization, there are no infinities. So Z lambda is one then typically you will get corrections at order lambda r okay so that's lambda r some of the coefficients may vanish but in general you will get uh, non zero coefficients now you have seen that you get a pole simple pole or 1 over epsilon pole okay so you are going to get something here which is proportional to 1 over epsilon 
okay time some constant okay what you have in the numerator is a constant it does not depend on mu mr any scales okay neither the external uh, momenta they are irrelevant so what you get is a constant and let me call that constant as a1 comma 1 okay the first one here stands for the order of lambda okay and the second one here stands uh, tells you that you have a pole simple pole right you, the epsilon power is 1 that's what it is telling you then if you go to order lambda square meaning you are going higher order in perturbation theory then you will encounter two loops okay then you will have in addition to a single pole you will have a double pole also okay so the highest order pole will be 1 over epsilon square okay, it will be more divergent and again uh, the coefficient will be a constant and I will call it A2 that two first two stands for the second order in lambda r comma 2 and this 2 stands for the second order of the pole so this is an order 2 pole and that's why this 2 here and you will also have a single pole so you'll have A2 comma 1 over epsilon okay this two refers to again the fact that you are at lambda r square and this one tells you that you are looking at a simple pool epsilon to the one one over epsilon to the one okay and the general structure is that it will be lambda r to the n a n n so you'll get order n pool at order lambda r to the n Okay, then you will have lower poles and this ends at finally a simple pole at order n okay so at every order you are going to get uh, poles of so at order n you are going to get poles of order n and minus 1 and minus 2 up to order 1 okay a simple pole so all these will be present so that's the structure of z lambda Okay, so let me also write down what Zm would look like. It will be identical except for the difference in coefficients. So let's call let's call them Bs, B1, B2, and so forth. Okay, so that's the structure, and as I said, A I J and um, maybe I should use A I J and B I J are constants. Okay, so that's the general structure of these renormalization constants in MSK or MS Watson, the same thing. Okay, now um, I can of course uh, rewrite it slightly differently. And let's, instead of writing it as an expansion in lambda, I will write it as an expansion in the poles, the order of the poles. And then we are going to see something uh, very interesting. So I can write Z lambda as 1 plus. So let's collect all the order 1 over epsilon terms. Okay. So it will be what? Oops. It will be uh, lambda r times a1 comma 1. That's the uh, coefficient of 1 over epsilon coming from one loop the lowest order diagram which is proportional to lambda r then you will have contributions coming from lambda r square terms okay from higher order calculations uh, 
from order lambda r square calculation with co this coefficient okay and so forth okay i'm just regrouping i'm not doing anything uh, major okay and then you will also have um, other terms like one over epsilon square terms okay and you can similarly write what should be here okay plus one over epsilon cube and so forth so the structure will be that z lambda i can write as one plus um, a1 over epsilon, so this epsilon and A1 is this this piece. So A1 depends on lambda r, okay. It's a polynomial in lambda r of, uh, I mean, in principle you have, if this goes to, this keeps continuing, right, you should not have stopped here because you can calculate up to infinite orders. Okay, so this is a polynomial, okay. Um, then you will have one over epsilon square terms, which is called the coefficient to be a2, and a2 is again a function of lambda r, okay, and the dependence is like this, plus, stop working already, and so forth. And the same is true for z of m. Okay, where a1 is, for example, this thing. Now, um, before proceeding further, let me first show you that beta tilde or the beta function does not depend on mu explicitly in the MS bar scheme. Okay, and that is what I'm going to utilize later. So, let me do that. So from here, it's not so much clear that beta tilde does not depend on mu explicitly. Right? So this term, as far as this term is concerned, it's clear that dependence on mu is through mu r. So that's implicit. This factor is implicit. But then you have a factor of mu here. Okay, So it's not so obvious that it does not depend on mu explicitly. Right? The z's do not depend on mu explicitly because you are in MS bar scheme. Okay, and I should argue that this ent entire factor also here at the bottom does not depend on mu explicitly. Okay, so how do we see that? So one over z lambda times mu dz lambda over d mu. Okay, this is one over z lambda. And then let's write the total derivative as the partial derivatives. So mu del over del mu plus del over del lambda r times mu del lambda r over d, uh, del mu, uh, d, mu d lambda r over d mu, and that is what is called beta tilde, okay, plus del over del m r, d m r over d mu, acting on z of lambda. 
Okay, and as I have said already, that z lambda is independent of m r. So this derivative acting on this gives you zero. Similarly, this derivative acting on z lambda gives you zero because there is no explicit dependence on mu. So that also uh, gives you zero. Okay, so what we are left with is only this term. So you get beta tilde del delta z lambda over delta lambda r times 1 over z lambda. Okay, so that's what you get. Now let me put that back in, uh, in this equation, this let me box it. Not that I want. Okay. Also, maybe this equation. Okay. So, um, yeah. So I'll substitute that thing in here okay i have just uh, written down 1 over z lambda mu dz lambda over d mu as as beta tilde 1 over z lambda del z lambda over del lambda r okay now the derivative is with respect to lambda r instead of mu so i'll go i'm going to put this in here so what do i get Okay, so I will write it again. So we had there B. Why doesn't it go away? So that equation was beta tilde is equal to minus 2 epsilon lambda r minus lambda r times 1 over z lambda mu dz lambda over d mu. 1 over z lambda mu dz lambda over d mu. And I have found that 1 over z lambda mu dz lambda over d mu is beta tilde times this factor. So it becomes. This is beta tilde times 1 over z lambda times dz lambda over d lambda r, okay, not mu. Now, if you look at this equation, there is mu dependence which is implicit here through lambda r, again implicit through lambda r, then you have a beta tilde, z lambda does not depend on mu explicitly. So the derivative with respect to lambda r also gives you a function that does not depend explicitly on mu. And this, of course, 1 over z lambda does not depend explicitly on mu. So when you solve this equation, you will get for beta tilde a function that does not depend explicitly on mu. Okay. So from here, you conclude that beta tilde does not depend explicitly on mu okay another thing uh, for the same argument from the same argument you also see that uh, beta tilde does not depend uh, does not depend on mr okay right because mr does not appear anywhere here okay because the only way it could have entered 
is through Z lambda, but Z lambda in MS scheme does not depend on MR. So beta tilde also does not depend on MR. Okay. Good. So So what do I have? So I started with beta tilde as a function of lambda r, m r and mu. And now I have argued that this is an, of course it would also be a function of epsilon. But now I have uh, concluded that beta tilde is only a function of lambda r and epsilon. It does not depend on mu and MR explicitly, mu explicitly and it does not depend on MR. Okay, excellent. Now, yeah. Now what I will show you is that if you look at the beta function, okay, and beta function is important because that is telling you how lambda r changes as you change mu so that you know your uh, bare coupling constant does not change remember we always uh, we are always trying to ensure that when we change mu we don't start changing the theory okay and that is what is ensured by making sure that the bare parameters do not change and that has led us to the beta function okay and beta function is telling you how uh, lambda r the renormalized coupling constant changes when you change mu okay so as of now i have concluded that beta function is independent of mu and mr and is dependent only on lambda r and epsilon okay and also i can calculate that because um, here beta tilde can be calculated once you know z of lambda because you just take these derivatives Okay, and Z lambda, how do you get? Z lambda are the counter terms, okay, uh, that you, I mean, this uh, coupling const, sorry, renormalization constants that you get by uh, subtracting the infinities, okay, which is arranged by the counter terms. So when you do a loop calculation to one loop or two loop or whatever loop order, that will give you the expression of Z lambda because Z lambda or Zm, these are the things which you adjust to remove the poles, okay? So a loop calculation will give you Z lambda, take the derivative, and that will give you beta lambda, beta tilde, okay? That's how you obtain the beta function. So, um, now I want to show you that uh, the beta function is, uh, receives contributions only from the single pole terms. So what I mean to say is, this. So if you look at this expression, which is going to give you beta tilde upon taking these derivatives of z, it's, it looks like that all the poles will contribute, right? Because z lambda has poles, simple poles, poles of order 2, meaning 1 over epsilon square terms, poles of order 3, meaning 1 over epsilon cube terms, as I wrote somewhere here here so z lambda has all kinds of terms right 1 over epsilon 1 over epsilon square 1 over epsilon cube what i'm going to show you is that these terms these coefficients a3 a2 they do not appear in the beta function what appears is only a1 and what's a1 a1 is this a1 gets a contribution from one uh, order lambda term okay the lowest order calculation will give you a11 second order uh, calculation will give you a21 and so forth okay but the result is going to depend only on 1 over epsilon no, sorry the, the coefficients of only 1 over epsilon will contribute meaning if you do a calculation at one loop two loop three loop and so forth what is relevant for beta function is just the coefficient of simple pole terms from one loop, from two loop, from three loop, etc. Okay, you don't have to include, uh, you, you will not uh, be including this kind of term. Okay, that's what I'm going to show you now.
So, um, so now, now we will see. only single pole terms contribute to beta function. Okay, so let's see that. Um, So let's look at mu dz lambda over d mu. Okay. This is, we have seen just now that, where is that? This is uh, mu dz lambda over d mu is beta tilde z lambda over delta lambda r. Okay. I'm just dropping out one over lambda from both the sides. So it is beta tilde. Actually, I can replace by a total derivative. It does not matter because there is no other uh, variable in Z lambda. It's just lambda R. Okay, so let me in fact do that. So what does that give you? It gives you beta tilde. Now we are taking the derivatives. So Z lambda, the first term is one. Differentiated with lambda R gives you zero. So that goes away. Second term is one over epsilon. Okay, so the expression of z lambda that I'm taking is uh, this one in this form, okay. not in this form, not this one. I mean, they are both the same, no, there is no difference. But this is how I have organized in terms of poles. Okay, so that gives you one over epsilon, and the derivative of the simple pole term, the coefficient of the simple pole, plus one over epsilon square d2 over d lambda r, plus one over epsilon cube, and so forth. Okay. Now, also recall that we have already argued that 1 over z mu dz lambda over d mu is finite. Okay, and this thing I'm going to call as f of lambda r. So f of lambda r is finite. Okay, that's just a name given to this factor, uh, this object. So now you substitute this. Uh, in one, so what you get is, so I'm just, which one did I call something else one earlier? One. Let me call this two. Let me call this three. Okay, so I'm just uh, putting this here in this equation, equation two. So you get f of r. So I'm dividing the equation two by z of lambda, z of lambda. So that gives you f of r, sorry, f of lambda r okay, is equal to beta tilde, that's the beta tilde here, over z lambda. Now I'll pull out one over epsilon times what you have here is dA one over d lambda r plus 1 over epsilon da2 over d lambda r plus other higher order pole terms. Okay, now uh, we can write beta tilde using f of r. So beta tilde, if you recall, it was minus 2 epsilon times lambda r. Okay minus 
lambda r times f of r. Sorry, f of lambda r. Right? Let me show you if you do not recall here. So beta tilde is minus 2 epsilon times lambda r minus lambda r times this is what I have defined as f of r, which is finite. f of lambda r, sorry, I keep saying f of r. Okay, so that's good. Now, um, now what? Okay, now I will take this z of lambda and multiply on the left hand side. Okay. And z of lambda is 1 plus a1 over epsilon plus a2 over epsilon square and so forth into f of r, f of lambda r, that is equal to, um, so this z of lambda is on the other side now, beta tilde, okay, where beta tilde is minus 2. Um, epsilon times lambda r and I will divide by this epsilon okay so it gives you minus 2 lambda r minus it is lambda r times f of lambda r and then because of this division by epsilon it gives you a factor of 1 over epsilon okay times d a 1 over d lambda r plus 1 over epsilon d a 2 over d lambda r and other and other higher core terms. Okay, now let's compare um, uh, on both sides powers of epsilon. Okay, so compare powers of epsilon on both sides. So what do you get? Let's look at the lowest order term, which is I mean the finite term of 1 over epsilon 0 or epsilon to the 0. You get 1 times of f r, f of lambda r. So on the left you have f, on the right you have minus 2 lambda r times d a1 over d lambda r. Okay, any other term will be either 1 over epsilon or 1 over epsilon square and so forth. So if I am just comparing epsilon to the 0 term, on the left, then it is f is equal to minus 2 lambda r times d a1 over d lambda r. Okay, and remember what f is, f is this piece. Okay, and f is basically this piece, this piece here. Okay, that factor here. So what do I get? Um, let me write again. F is now minus 2 lambda r times d a1 over d lambda r. So in the MS bar, in the MS scheme, or MS bar also, we get beta tilde is equal to minus 2 epsilon lambda r minus lambda r times this factor, right? That factor is f minus 2 lambda r, check, yeah, there is a explicit factor of lambda r here, here, lambda r times 1 over z lambda mu dz lambda over d mu. Right, that is what we have mu dz lambda over d mu. That is what we have calculated. Okay. 1 over z lambda mu dz lambda over d mu. So that gives you, um, what was that? Minus 2 lambda r da1 over d lambda. Okay. So beta tilde is minus 2 epsilon lambda r plus 2 lambda r square d a1 over d lambda r. Okay, I hope I didn't make any mistakes. Okay. 
So what does that tell? It tells that when you are looking at the beta function, only A1 contributes. And what was A1? A1 was here. A1 was the coefficient of 1 over epsilon term. So you see, all these other poles of higher order, they have not contributed. Okay, so if you, as I was saying earlier, if you were to calculate a three loop or four loop, whatever, for the beta function, only the coefficient of sing, simple pole is relevant, okay, not the poles of higher orders. Okay, good. So we have um, now some understanding about um, the renormalization group of group equation for the coupling constant, and we also understand what kind of terms contribute to the beta function. Okay, we will continue our discussion further in the next video.